My name is Rebecca Taffel and I work at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation um, with Elizabeth Sackler to provide additional support to the center's already wonderful staff. Um, and so I'm thrilled to be able to be here today to um, introduce Hilda Holger, her legacy, the film screening. And then we're, I'm doubly excited because we have Primavera Bowman and Stephanie Jenkins to talk about the film after the screening. Um, for the past five years, the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art has continued to fulfill its commitment to the past, present, and future of feminist art. Using its award-winning exhibition and education spaces, the Sackler Center strives to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions dialogue and debate about feminist art, theory, activism um, take place here in the center's forum, and groundbreaking exhibitions are held in its feminist art and her story galleries. If you haven't had a chance um, to go see the exhibition out uh, in the galleries, I highly recommend it. Um, it's called Materializing Six Years, Lucy R. Lepard and the Emergence of Conceptual Art. Um, it's a groundbreaking show. It's wonderful. It's only up for a couple more weeks. So uh, if you have some time uh, or energy afterwards, please take a look. But um, as con the center, though, as conceived by Dr. Sackler, is more than just its gallery spaces. It's a place for open and free discourse, conversation, and the exchange of ideas. Um, in fact, those are the things we celebrate the most here. Um, Dr. Sackler could not be here today but, um, because of some ongoing health problems, but she asked me to express how delighted she is not only to have the uh, Hilda Holger, her legacy, screened here today, but also to have the privilege of a discussion by Primavera and Stephanie um, to illuminate the life and work of Hilda Holger, a pioneer of modern expressionist dance. Uh, on the heritage floors, um, on, uh, in the dinner party by Judy Chicago, other influential modern dancers like Isadora Duncan and Martha Graham um, and Sophie Tauber are, are, are honored by name. And I think it's only appropriate to honor Hilga Holger's work um, among her equals and her contemporaries. Um, so before we start the film, I'm going to do a brief introduction of Primavera and Stephanie, and then we'll get right to the screening, and then the conversation will follow directly afterwards. Uh, also, I quickly wanted to mention that there is a sign-up sheet in the back if you're interested in learning more about the film and more about Hilda. Filmmaker Primavera Bowman is Hilda Holger's daughter and an accomplished artist in her own right. She has impressive credentials in sculpture, dance, design, music, and film. She trained with British abstract sculptor Sir Anthony Caro at London's prestigious St. Martin's School of Art, finishing with first degree honors. Primavera took her first dance lessons at the Hilde Holger School of Modern Dance in London and went on to receive extensive dance training here in the US at the Martha Graham School, the Merce Cunningham School, and with renowned ballet teacher Maggie Black. She has been an instructor in the Alvin Ailey American Dance Center and performed with Twyla Tharp Dance Company, among others. Like her mother, Primavera was ahead of her time. She was a student of Zen meditation and yoga before either entered the mainstream. As a result of her fascination with movement and medicine, she developed a technique called alignment therapy and remains a dedicated teacher both here and in London. Since 2001, Primavera has been promoting her mother's legacy through performances, museum shows, lectures, workshops, an archive, and this documentary film. Stephanie Jenkin has been a producer for CNN for 13 years, focusing on political, international, and business news. In her current role as an editorial producer, she researches and writes interviews for the network's chief business correspondent, Ali Velshi. Before going into television, Stephanie was a print journalist and political risk consultant based in the Middle East. She has received a number of international fellowships, including a Fulbright to Jordan, academic scholarships to Israel, and journalism exchanges to Korea, China, Taiwan, Singapore, and Germany. She earned a master's degree in Middle Eastern Studies from St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford, and a bachelor's degree in journalism and Hebrew literature with honors from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Stephanie is a native New Yorker and currently resides in Brooklyn, New York. She dropped out of the Elaine Klein's School of Ballet at age seven, but throughout the years has remained an enthusiastic supporter of contemporary dance. 
And now, Hilda Holger, her legacy. In 2001, I had to clear through the house and I saw wardrobes, boxes, overseas trunks, all filled with my mum's legacy. A friend of my mother's saw HH very clearly stamped on one of the big overseas trunks. And he said, come on, just let's take a quick, quick look. And I've been looking ever since, I have to say. So literally, for the last 10 years, I've been archiving and attempting to conserve what came out of all those trunks. I recall a telephone conversation I had uh, from New York, and I was bitching that she never had time to talk to me, she was always busy working. And then she thought I wasn't taking her seriously enough, so she said, you will know who your mother is after I die. In 2010, I initiated Move About, a series of inclusive dance workshops. I was one of the six teachers who studied with Hilda. I had no idea when I knocked on the Hilda's door where I was going. At that stage, I just wanted to be, I don't even know I wanted to be a dancer. I wanted to be in dance to make sure that people realize where we come from. She was instrumental uh, to in influencing not just me and Royston and, and Thomas and all the others, but all, lots of people who came through here in the studio through those doors have been influenced, I'm telling you. In, in their own way, they may not know it even that they've been influenced by her. I must say it made me want to run out and take dance lessons again. <laughs> so I wanted to start with the beginning and I'm just going to start by asking Primavera a few questions, get the party started, but I know that she's amongst friends and admirers and students, so um, I'd like to be inclusive, as her mother would say, and open up the floor rather quickly for a discussion. Um, I don't feel like you need to have a question. It's okay even just to have a comment and tell Primavera how you felt about the film or what you felt was interesting about it. But I wanted to start with really at the beginning. I mean, when did you get the idea to make the film and was it something that you ever discussed with your mother? No, never. I mean, my mother and I lived quite separately. I was here teaching and doing my stuff, and she was over there, and she was always too busy to talk to me. And both my parents were very busy. So I actually learned from the family, from going through all the papers in the house, you know, who my father was, who my mother was. So it was quite odd, actually. So let's go back to that, because when the film ended, there was someone back there saying he was just imagining what it was like to open up those trunks. So what year was that? And specifically, what did you find? We saw some of the costumes, some of the photos, but it was there a was, treasure trove. It was, yeah, because what happened is, um, I, did, I couldn't understand because when she left to go to India, she kept saying, I only have like one groschen in my bra and nothing. But then I said, where, where do these trunks come from? So then I had some historians come to visit me and one Dr. Margit Franz was in the movie, she said, let's you know go through the letters because i couldn't read german so <clears throat> and then we found out that you know my grandmother knew she was going to auschwitz my mother had about 25 people killed in auschwitz so um uh friends and friends but mainly family as well and um so the mother knew so she she knew her daughter escaped to india so she put everything in those trunks and had silk stockings with moth eggs in it <laughs> I'd, I'd, i mean absolutely everything you know everything to do with her career was in those trunks so you were just saying that this is your awakening of who your mother is, and when we talked before the showing of this film, you had said to me that you actually didn't know that your mother was a famous dancer in no, Vienna. No, I had no idea, no. So this was the moment. Yeah, because then I saw these photographs and I read the reviews. There's like a whole house. If you go on the Hilda Holger website, we've kind of added a bit to the website so you can see some of the things that, you know, that I have in the house in London. And now actually I'm becoming a political activist. I, I faxed the prime minister yesterday because they want to build a high-speed train under my house. <laughs> So that's yet yeah, another facet to all this. So, um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, um, it's, I forgot what I was gonna say. 
they're finding out that she was famous. Yeah, yeah, I saw these pictures where she was very beautiful, and you know, when I was growing up, she started to become more and more arthritic. So then she couldn't walk anymore. So I, it was a sad picture. You know, then I, I think she had a lot of anger against what happened to her family and that her career was ruined and her friends were all killed and made to look like suicide when it wasn't even a suicide. And so I just delved more and more. And I didn't even know what the secession of the Hagenbund was. I have to say, and Yamala Weizenbock from the Theater Museum in Vienna came and looked through the page and said, you know, you've got Nazi letters here. I didn't know what I had. I was ready to just sell the house and, you know, and uh, throw it all away, you know. So then a friend, has how we met through Albert uh, uh, Mizak, he said, now let's start to look through. So then when we looked through, he left, went to America with his family, and I was, I'm still stuck there going through all the stuff, trying to archive as a complete amateur, you know, conservationist and archivist, and this is like every, everything that I'm doing is nothing that I was trained to do. So um, it was, you know, it was an interesting leap for me. So you've, you've mentioned Albert, who's a mutual friend of ours, and I know that he played a part in your mother's life after, later on. He was organizing, he himself was Austrian, living in London, and he'd been a performer, and I know that he was organizing a cultural event right, in London, as well. and he felt like he rediscovered your mother for the Austrians. Yes, and he, he's, I must say, give him a lot of credit because without Albert, I wouldn't have even known anything. I would have just dumped everything and, you know. So what, what were her feelings about later on in terms of keeping a connection with Vienna and Austrian culture? Was it something she... No, I mean, because she, I, I had to uh, go to Vienna to get the, uh, the thing, the Rathausmann from the mayor's office there, and she didn't want to go. And then when she, she should have got it, but when she died posthumously, I got a, another very high award from the Austrian government. The, the ambassador in London gave it to me. And um, she couldn't care less <laughs> because, you know, she suffered. I mean, she really, um, you know, suffered. So this is not a film about dance necessarily. It's about opening up to other people. That's, that's what the film is about. And I want to pick up on that for a minute. Um, what do you think was the impact of her time in India? It was probably about nine years. Nine, she started years. a family there. How did, how did it change her philosophy of dance, of movement, of cultural expression? Well, she, one of her students, uh, who's actually in the film, but she died since the film finished, um, she, she said, you know, your mother used to always say, you know, where do you come from? Because they'd ask her. She was blonde and blue-eyed, and they, you know, everyone looked very different. And so she said, I'm made in Vienna, <laughs> you know, so, so it was, um, but then she, I read in some of the letters and notes that she studied with this lady, I think Manaka, and she was, uh, she was asked to choreograph when she was in England, she went back for the, the cousin of um, Uda Shankar, Sachin Shankar had a, a company also, and so she was friends with Rangopali. He taught in her studio and, and Uda Shankar and everyone, so she was very much involved in, in, uh, an artist came to draw in her classes, you know, some Indian, some Western. So I think she's very much a person that um, breaks boundaries, you know, for religion. I mean, here she's a, born a Jew, but she's doing on the altar of a church, you know, and a lot of her themes are actually um, Christian Catholic themes, you know, martyrdom of St. Sebastian, uh, I mean, there's so many, you know, so she, she just didn't care about boxing people in. I guess, I guess I'm the same as I wouldn't have faxed the prime minister yesterday. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> We, I want to pick up on the inclusiveness, really, because um, you know she had pioneered what's now called inclusive dance, and in a way, your brother Darius was her great teacher. So, talk a little bit about that, because you were in the house then. You know, you saw it up close. How did that evolve? Yeah, I mean, uh, he used to always watch, as, as they said in the film, he always watched the classes. And I remember once there were some quite, <clears throat> you know, technically royal ballet good dancers. And they couldn't understand what my mother wanted. So my brother just suddenly came down the stairs, you know, twirled and fell on the floor. He said, that's what I want, you know? So, I mean, Down syndrome, I mean, I have friends that taught Down syndrome, and they say, you know, their, their, their aesthetic sense is highly developed, you know, of music. And, and once he played piano, he couldn't read music, but this uh, concert pianist came to the house and said, who is that musician? The rhythm is incredible. And, he, you know, he's just banging away, but, you know, amazing rhythm. But, he, you know, he didn't have the right, you know, he didn't, you know, you, you know more, he's a doctor of neuropsychology, so she knows more. But, um, <clears throat> um, yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, my, my brother, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I talked with a friend who's also in the audience that it would make a great feature film because, you know, this person had three holes in his heart, wet lungs, 
Down syndrome, I mean, you know, couldn't do anything hardly, and yet he influenced my father. They came up with a non-toxic cure for cancer that he was researching at Aston University, and then my mother came up with this inclusive dance, and now you see, you know, Royston had got an OBE from the Queen, and, you know, it's a big thing. America hasn't reached here. It's just beginning, I think, you know, but, but it's been going since the 70s, 80s in, in Europe and England called community dance, inclusive dance. Would you say that that's her legacy? Um, I, th I think that's what that, I mean, you see, the problem is that, you know, there's very few people remember her from Vienna. I mean, I have letters saying that she looked like Jesus Christ on stage, like the Madonna, and, you know, so that's all I have. There's no footage. I mean, so it's, we reconstructed those early dances for the British Museum, for the Theatre Museum in Vienna, but um, there's nothing really there. So what, the, the living legacy is the inclusive dance, for sure, yeah. Right. You, you, ooh. You talked about this as, as a very human and emotional story, not just a story about dance. And um, I wanted to pick up on that because we saw that in Vienna, your mother was on the cusp of opening up this very you know, well-heeled dance school in the Pasha's street. And she had this illustrious career there. And then that got short, cut short by the Nazis and the Anschluss. And then again, she's about to open up this dance school, or she did in Bombay, mm -hmm. and again, she has to leave because of war. And we see finally she does, and she has this tremendous legacy as a choreographer and a teacher. And I can't help but mention, since we're sitting in the Sackler Gallery, feminist art, I mean, did she see herself as a feminist figure, or no, just the life no, that no, she no, definitely, led? Definitely, definitely, because I mean, I've, I've, when I've talked to different historians and museum people in Vienna, I mean, you know, after the First World War, you know, women were, you know, doing men's jobs, and suddenly they were meant to be house frows again, and they rebelled, so there was a whole uh, movement of, you know, dancers going naked and <laughs> dancing freely, and to say, look, here I am, you know? So, so um, definitely she was feminist from, from background, from Vienna, but, um, but she always used to say to me growing up, you know, a woman doesn't have to have a man in their life, you know, you can be, you must be independent, so she kind of hammered that into my head all the time, you know, so she, um, she, she believed that women are equal to men and, you know, very much a feminist. Before I open it up to the floor, I wanted to ask you on a personal level, what was it like to be her student? Um, well, the students, they all love her, but they all, you know, get really upset because she's very tough. What was it like for you? Uh, it was worse for me because if, <laughs> if anyone was, was talking in the, in the class, you know, she, instead of telling that person, she'd say, oh, it's you, go up, you know, <laughs> she'd make an example of me all the time. So I don't know why she did that, but and she always said, you know, she always said, you know, life is hard, so I have to, you know, get you ready for that. So I never had a cozy childhood, you know, it was always a very... Um, I don't know, amazing childhood, but it wasn't, wasn't so relaxing. <laughs> I know you're among friends here, and there are dancers and filmmakers, and so I wanted to open it up for, for discussion, for comment, for questions on any area. Don't be shy. Well, I, oh. I just wanted to say, um, I've been prematurely talking about someone in the audience who had suggested the feature film on the first end. And now more than ever, Prim, I think that this is about you. This is about the discovery of my mother. The film is that. That's right, I mean, it's, That's yeah. really the whole point of it. And I really felt the impact of it today more than any, any other time. It's funny because there's another friend in the audience, Serge Raoul, and I talked to his son the other day, and he's making a film on his father and on his, the, the restaurant Raoul's, and exactly ditto, word for word, Karim was saying the same. Is this a film about the change in Soho? Is it a film about the restaurant? Is it a film about my father? Is it a film about me? What do I want? So I said, join the club. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are two stories here. There's her story and then there's your story. And, and, and we discover her through your eyes. Right. Because, you discover. because that's all there is. I mean, I don't have even you know, footage of her. I think to a certain degree, yes, but not, not to the complete extent that she did, because, you know, because of what she did with my brother, then Wolfgang, you know, you, see, you saw that there were completely yeah. people with MS and, and all kinds of, and blind, and, right. and, and they're performing, and they love it. I mean, they live for those performances, and, you know, we went to Vienna together, and, and uh, it's, it's um, so maybe it wouldn't have quite been so, such a dramatic shift, but, but definitely 
I she mean, would have gone that way anyway. Yeah, because, you know, going to India, she crossed so many boundaries. I mean, she was, you know, she was born into a kind of a wealthy family, and then it went down after the First World War, and she met Franz Josef, and, you know, in India she met Gandhi, and I have a signed picture of Gandhi that you saw in the film, you know. And, but then, you know, more and more as she developed, she became more compassionate, less the narcissistic, you know, artist, solar, here I am, look at me, and more like, you know, let's give some love out, let them experience what I experienced through my art form. Can everybody hear the questions, by the way? Because I'm happy to repeat them. I think so, definitely, because what, with the carers, you know, I used to be very involved in his care though, since my mother died for 10 years, and they said, you know, something very special about him, you know, he, he, he always says thank you, and, and he's, you know, all the carers said, you know, so much so that actually the website for my mother is done by one of the carers, because, you know, he, he influenced people with, with all his problems, he, he influenced people, and he, everyone, you would go, to, I'd take him to doctor appointment after doctor appointment, x-rays, this, that, and then, you know, the doctor would be sitting there, you know, waiting for the x-ray machine, and after, after you know, he said, oh, thank you. And they would have a big smile, you know, every time, you know, afterwards. He would change people's lives. People on the street would say, oh, there's that nice man. He would, like, stand back. He could hardly stand up and let the old lady pass, you know. So that, that he learned from my mother, from being around normal people and not being locked up like some they used to do. So as much as it extended the, the length of his life, probably also the quality oh, of his life. Definitely the quality. Definitely, yeah. Other questions? I, oh. Um, she says that she did not prepare her lessons, but was there a standard class? Yeah, there was a, there was a basic how, class. How did it start? Well, it, I, when I studied with her, it started with plies, tendues, and then she would start doing that, that Bowdoin visa stuff, as you saw, you know, where she would kind of do, I once studied with, some, uh, what's her name, Svoboda, the American Ballet thing. She also did like moving bars where you would kind of step and turn, step and turn, rather than having everything basic, like Maggie used to teach or like American Ballet Theater used to teach. So then she would develop the bar and then <clears throat> she would, you know, do a center, do, and then she would do a little bit of improvisation. And as she got older and couldn't demonstrate, I think the improvisation element got, got greater. So it would be, you know, almost like a choreographic class, you know, more than just a pure technique class. But there's always a technical thing at the beginning to warm up. Yes, he's a doctor and a homeopath. Could you explain, did you use homeopathy with your brother? Well, he, he did at the beginning, yes. And then he did, I remember, oh, sorry, then I remember vaguely he did um, uh, something out of the urine. He used to give this, make this vaccine for my brother out of urine. And then, then he kind of, you know, my brother was saved, so to speak. He kept him going. And then he started to do stuff with... Um, um, uh, very high-grade yeast, peptides, and it's funny, I met a doctor just recently, and he was saying that, you know, what, what did your father, because he saw something on the internet, and, and I said, he worked with yeast, he said, my God, I'm working with the same thing, it's 45% in that same yeast, so he said, your father had a, was looking at the moon without a telescope, he didn't have the technique we have now, you know, so both my parents were incredibly um, down-to-earth and intuitive, you know, and I guess, and just made the best of it always, always you know. Yes. I have a sister with Down syndrome, and my family used homeopathy with her. My mother and father used to bring her into a hospital here in New York City once a week when we were in the morning, so she was about six years old. Hope Flower Get That, which was a homeopathic hospital. And there was a Russian doctor who had worked with peptides and worked with. And oh, I know. What's his name? I know. Um, what's his name? What? Hyman, Hyman Gold. Oh, no, that's someone else. No.
homeopathy got wiped out. Um, <clears throat> Rockefeller was, uh, used homeopathy, the Queen of England uses it, and Prince Charles uses homeopathy, and they always made fun of. But, I mean, for, for uh, chronic diseases where, you know, it's not an acute situation, homeopathy sometimes can cause miracles where allopathy cannot, you know, so... Yeah. I mean, and, but also, you know, the, the, the other thing is the movement thing. I mean, movement is such an important thing because you're using your left and your right brain, your physical, your emotional, your mental. And, you know, we sit now on the computer and I'm, I worry for these kids because all they do is this, this. You know, they don't move, you know. They don't get any sunlight. <laughs> There's, there's multiple stories because not only her but her students and her, you know it's multiple. It's a feature film, I think. <laughs> uh, as a former student of your mother. Oh hi, Louise. Oh my God, I remember you when I was a teenager. Wow, great that you came. Uh, you know, in dancing in her company with Carl, mm -hmm. saw Carl, wonderful Carl, and Wolf. You're in that picture there. Yes. I think so. Yeah, I was a bit jealous. Yeah, but are you are you, are you still are you still an? weren't you a psychologist? I'm yes, vaguely, I'm a so yeah, I, I remember your face now and immediately. I mean, how did you find this? How did you know? Oh, you saw. Wow, you see how the circle is amazing. That's great. Yeah, because I lost touch with you. You know, there's, um, I don't know, is, um, there's another student that was jumping on the beach in Jehu. I don't know, Nagesh, is she here? She said she was coming. I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, she's now Nagesh. I've traced her through the letters, and she's a, a, a doctor, a very fine doctor, Albert Einstein. But I don't know if she came. <clears throat> wow, what a treat to have you here. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about making the film, because it's not been without its challenges, right. and that's really a tribute to your tenacity and drive. Yeah, well, I mean, basically, there was about eight major films, eight edits, and um, when we first started it, we just got, you know, a young man that did films for the Amiki Company, for Wolfgang, and he, um, you know, we, we just commissioned him to make a film of the workshop, Move About, and, but then when we saw it, there were all these talking heads and we all kind of started to fall asleep. So then, so then we had, had the, the company then, so we discussed it. We said, well, maybe we should put some earlier work of the, of the teachers because, you know, just watching the workshops is not visually that exciting. And then as the, as the edits progressed, I said, wait a minute, I have to have a bigger hand in this because, you know, we have to put my mother in it. So then every edit, there was a bit more of my mother. <laughs> 
So then it was a, a fight between, you know, do we do my mother or do we do the six students, you know, and, and you know, it's just so multi-layered. So um, it was quite a fight because the, the, the filmmaker didn't want to, I mean, I'm actually not the filmmaker, Alan Bauer was the filmmaker, and, but more and more it became my film, so I insisted that I have to edit with him. He didn't want me, but finally I did, and then it became, everyone said, oh, it improved so much. And, um, and now um, I might, if I get some funding, I might enlarge it 10 minutes and, and make it more of a feature type of thing because some cinemas are interested possibly here. And I originally we made it for television, but we have um, a lot of copyrights within the film, even though it's my mother and I own the, the film, etc. You know, one, that first picture of my mother where she goes like this, Getty Images wants, wants to charge me 100 for my own personal use, 100 pounds, and about four or 5,000 for broadcast. I mean, that's only one picture, and it's my mother. I mean, it's so insane. It's just insane. So now I'm, I'm trying to fundraise. It's a shame to not have this film out there. You know, I mean, if I had some money, I could... Yeah, so it's the usual thing. I mean, a lot of films, um, they sit in closets because they can't pay the copyrights to the broadcasting, you know, for clips that they have, etc. And it's, it's becoming out of hand, actually. You know, so I had one more question before we have to um, go. But before I do that, I wanted to mention that there's a sign-up sheet in the back on a clipboard, of just your name and address if you wanted to keep in touch as you know her legacy in archive and film progresses, so that Primavera has a way to reach people who came out today and are interested. So the last question I wanted to ask you really was: if your mother was here today and she saw this film, I know she was a tough cookie. What would she say? Um, it's very, very difficult. I don't know. <laughs> because she's incredibly critical. I mean, that's why I think I grew up like this. <laughs> because nothing was good enough, you know. It's that thing, if you're a surgeon, why aren't you a lawyer? You're a lawyer. No, why aren't you a judge, you know? So, so, um, so I, I don't know what she would say. But I think basically deep down, even if she doesn't say it, she probably would be very flattered that I took the time. Because I've actually taken about 11 years out of my own life. And you know, some of my students they say, well, when are you coming back to New York? You know, I go back and forth because I have this house which now the British government wants to dig a tunnel underneath. So that's yet another thing. And I'm trying to save the archive. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get it into a good institution that would you know, take proper care of it. Because it's a shame I did all this work and she carted it from one way or the other, from Vienna to Bombay to London. And, and you know, it's already attracted, I mean, one historian is in writers in the audience, Lena Bernstein, you know, I've, I've already attracted a lot of people. And actually, I'm becoming a hub for all these people because my mother was all over the place. You know, so people are connecting through me putting her story up in one way or the other. You know, so it's, um, in a way, it's a very Jewish story because, you know, Jews, poor thing, had to leave, you know, and leave there and let, uh, and then, you know, but, the, but it's, it's, it's also a contemporary story because, I mean, the same thing's happening now with the Muslims and the, and the Christians and the, and the fighting in Syria, and there's nothing changed, you know, so it's a universal story, and I think, you know, if I had a, a little bit more money, I would like to extend it to kind of push that. I think the thing with Wolfgang at the end with the tsunami and with the Tamil Tigers and the government soldiers is very moving. It's too bad it's only very amateur footage, but I think even that, it, it, you know, the heartstrings kind of, you know, twang. Because uh, he's, he's, a, he's a saint, that guy, a complete saint. They all are, all the students, my mothers, they, they, they have tremendous patience. I mean. Um, uh, Royson Muldoon, he does projects. I, I've watched a rehearsal here when he was doing something at Carnegie Hall, and I think Nicholas went to see it, and Jose went to see it, I think. And uh, even with a rehearsal and a dinky little player with the Rite of Spring and, and all these you know, tough Harlem kids, I mean, it was quiet after two hours. He just didn't even raise his voice, but he managed to get them all quiet, and they were like different people, and, and I had goosebumps because I could see that transformation. Those, those kids now had something to live with. Here they were going to dance with Sir Simon Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic, I and mean, that's not something a Harlem kid normally does. So, you know, it's, it's through art. It, it breaks so many boundaries of poverty and wealth and, and religion and... You know, it's a wonderful medium, and I don't think it's... I think they're beginning to tap it in Europe with this inclusive community dance, but I think it hasn't really taken hold in this country yet. You know, it's just beginning. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out today, and mostly I want to thank Primavera for thank coming you. and sharing with us. Thanks for coming. <laughs>